And uh, speaking at I IMSC is like uh, speaking at home for me. <laughs> uh, all old friends of you. And uh, so today, uh, what I will talk to you about is a ab uh, few things about the work of Diophantus of Alexandria. So the idea is to go back to this great man to see what he has done and to go through the ages up to modern mathematics and to see how the questions that were raised are now translated into modern mathematics and may follow up from uh, larger, uh, more general questions. Okay, so uh, maybe I write his name because it's uh, so it's Diophantus of Alexandria. So he's probably one of the most famous ancient mathematicians. Uh, but uh, peculiarly, almost nothing is known about him. Yeah? I can uh, start. This, this is better? Is it just the extreme right that doesn't work? Or? Okay. So I, if I cut a line here, it will be fine? Okay. Okay, okay. Oh, that because of this, uh, this thing. Okay, and the uh, notes were out Okay. So anyway, we don't need much of the blackboard now. I'm just uh, talking to you about a story. So what is known about him is unconfirmed. He's probably born around. 200, 220 of this era. And he probably lived in Alexandria. So it's probably due to the trouble period uh, at that uh, time in this uh, area of the world that leads to such a paucity of information because uh, of the same generation, much lesser known mathematicians, we know quite a lot about them. And uh, so, we can say a lot about uh, him. He is considered as uh, partly the father of number theory, and in any case, the father of the theory of Diophantine equations, named after him. By some, he is also called, uh, considered as the father of algebra. Uh, some people attribute the birth of algebra to the Arab mathematicians, people like al Khwarizmi, and so on, in a couple of centuries later. But uh, it is confirmed that the unknown, the X, that many people consider as the, uh, the root of algebra, the day you introduce the unknown, you start with structures, right? And this was introduced by him, and it was called in Greek the plethos. So at least this, this we know. Okay. And uh, so, what uh, is his main contribution? His main contribution is a formidable uh, collection of thirteen books called Arithmetica. Okay, so it's apparently there is a consensus about uh, among historians that there were thirteen books, but even that is not so clear because most of them are lost. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, is a German mathematician Regio Montanus. So Regio Montanus uh, lived in the fifteenth century. He is almost unknown. But he uh, happened to have a student who happened to himself have a very brilliant, talented student who was called Copernic. So this is a, so it was a, he was a member of the main schools at that time. And uh, he found a manuscript in Roma in 1463. 
found a manuscript. And this manuscript uh, was found among a bunch of uh, things that were brought back in Roma after the loot of Constantinopolis in 1453, when the uh, Roman armies went to take over Constantinopolis, now it's called Istanbul. Uh, they brought back many things. And uh, among them, there was this manuscript. And it, found, it turned out that this, uh, this uh, constituted of six first books out of 13 of Diophantes. So when you sp speak about Arithmetica of Diophantes, you speak about these ones, basically. These are the ones which are more or less confirmed. Uh, and uh, which were extensively studied. So he, uh, these books were later tra translated by Bachet. Bachet was a French mathematician, and in 1961, uh, in 1621, he gave a translation in Latin. Okay. So this is probably the best known edition of the book of Diophantus, and it's precisely the edition on which uh, Fermat uh, wrote down his famous marginal notes about his last theorem. And uh, these are the, the ones that uh, are really extensively studied. But more recently, in 1968, four more books were discovered in Iran. This throw a new light on what Diophantus knew. Uh, but to my knowledge, I am not sure that the historians have confirmed that these four more books actually come from more or less from the original manuscripts of the Diophantus or are add, uh, uh, contain too much of add-ons by the Arab mathematicians who extensively worked on Diophantus and progressed with that. So, but uh, I'm not uh, knowledgeable about that, so I would not say anything in one way or the other. Anyway, four more books were formed. But uh, so this is a bit peculiar for somebody who is so famous, nothing much is known about where I live. But there is something which is claimed to be known, known about his death, the age at which he lived. And in fact, in the fifth century, Metrodor, who was a Greek mathematician, but not so well known, tells us the following story. So I leave this story as an exercise to solve for our audience. Who claims that uh, the age of his death is precisely known. Why is that? Because there was an epitaph on his tomb. So what was the epitaph of the tomb? In this tomb lies Diophantus. Here are a few lines which will get, let you know the age of his death. When sixth marked his light, his childhood. Okay. Then one twelfth marked his adolescence. Out of the seven part of his life, one more went on before he got married. Then five years later, his wife gave him a beloved son. By a dreadful fate, his beloved child passed away at half of his own age. Okay. 
He survived in tears this disaster for four more years and then passed away. So tell me, passerby, at what age Diophantus passed away? So this is an easy one. Anyway, it shows that Diophantus was famous enough uh, for this story to be recorded or invented. In both cases, it shows that he carried a lot of influence because three centuries later, he is still mentioned while nothing much is known. Okay, so uh, we go, now we are going to go inside the book of Diophantus, which have 130 problems, pick one and study it. So this is precisely what we are going to do. So uh, this, I, I, my quotations are a bit uh, approximate because I quote by memory. I have not found in the IMSC library the Bache edition of uh, Diophantus. Uh, so uh, by memory, it's in the fourth book. around problem 20 to be checked. So the following is the problem in modern notation. Let S be the set 1, 3, 8. Okay, so this is easy. Then you have the following property. For all x not equal to y belonging to S, xy plus 1 is a perfect square. Okay, question. Can you enlarge S into S prime? with the same property. Of course, in integers. Okay? So this was the question. And uh, so uh, I will sh we shall discuss throughout this lecture this problem and see what uh, mathematics have been have developed around uh, around this. And uh, but uh, this probably is arguably the oldest conjecture that was ever solved in the 20th century. Because uh, people think about the Fermat's last theorem, but Fermat was raised, uh, the last theorem was raised by Fermat. This question was raised by Diophantus and solved by Baker and Davenport in the late 70s, late 60s. So about, uh, took a, a couple of years to, to solve that question. Okay, and in fact, it's clear that around this uh, this problem, there are, this question has been widely studied by Diophantus because he raises several other questions. The size of this set clearly interested him a lot. And for example, he, uh, though he doesn't like too much to work with non-integers, he suggests the following S tilde, which has four elements, but not with integers which are 1 16th, 13, 6 over 16, 17 over 4, and 1 over 5 over 16, with four elements. Again, with the question of enlarging it to 5, <laughs> right? Okay, so let us go, go on and study this. So this is uh, still to be banned, or is it, uh, it's okay now? It's okay now. Okay, so we uh, try to understand what happens from these properties. So I take x, supposedly belonging to S prime, to an enlarged uh, set. So you have x plus 1, 1 times x plus 1, which is x plus 1, is a square.
3 v square is equal to 6. By multiplying by 3, so putting the square inside and getting. So you, what you get in a, uh, is an equation of this form x square minus d y square equals a with d say a square free integer and a an integer. Okay. So, we concentrate now on integral solutions. Question of rationality I will talk a little bit about at the end of the lecture. It is not a, they, they raise several other questions. So, this is a very familiar, very uh, classical equation that you may have even uh, seen in your uh, classes. Okay. It is called a Pell equation. So, now the name is very, uh, uh, very, very uh, well installed in the literature. But in fact, uh, the name Pell equation comes from Euler. Euler gave the, that name and it is probably wrongly named after him. So many people had worked seriously on the equation before Pell and Pell's contribution is not so significant as to deserve that. But still it is called a Pell equation and we are not going to change it today. And uh, anyway, such an equation were already known from the Greek because in the books, the Greek books you can find this one for example. So, I will follow the journey of Dreyfus's book. We fall to Pierre de Fermat and then pass over to uh, other people. And then I will tell you uh, what else was done elsewhere. So, this, uh, this equation became very, very popular in Europe after Fermat had access to Bachet's edition of Dreyfus's book. This is when everything all started. And then uh, the Pell equation became so famous that it became a custom in Europe to send letters to other uh, colleagues to say with, with a given equation, we say with a large enough D and say I challenge you to solve that one. <laughs> okay? So that, that was a big game. So for example, uh, a follower of Fermat, Brenic de Bessy, challenged the British team with the equation like x2 minus 3, 1, 3, y2 equals 1. Okay? And uh, in fact, in uh, the British almost immediately responded with the solution, knowing that the smallest solution has at least 17 digits. Okay. So, this means that they had managed by that time to develop at least partial techniques to go through the equation. Right? So, this is what uh, we uh, uh, was. So, this uh, equation was pretty well mastered in Europe at the time of say Euler, everything had stabilized and was uh, almost uh, the state of the art in Europe. But all these developments continued where the Europeans were totally unaware because since the Europeans had quite a lot of interactions with the Arab school which was very strong at that uh, before that time especially they, the Arab school is the one that gave that permitted the Europeans to have access to the Fantas book they had absolutely no contact with the Indian school and in turn it turns out that in fact Bhaskara First Brahma Gupta, I should say, I should put an H. So this uh, Brahma Gupta is 598 to 668 and then Bhaskara so this is 114, 1185. 
they developed a complete and comprehensive algorithm to solve these equations. And uh, principally, as we shall uh, see uh, for the next few uh, uh, minutes, the important thing is to solve the equation with A equals plus or minus 1. So from the time being, now we will assume that A is plus or minus 1. And uh, this turns out to be very, very efficient. I'll uh, give you, so they, they developed, uh, the algorithm was called the Chakravala. And the European approach was that of continued fractions. Okay. And in fact, uh, the so the, the, the main input of uh, Pramagupta to this uh, approach is an identity that I can write to you for all A1, A2, B1, B2 in Z. Then you have A1 square minus D B1 square times A2 square minus D B2 square is equal to A1, A2 plus D B1, B2 whole square minus D A1 B2 plus B1 A2 whole square. This is called the Parmagupta identity. We'll come back to the identity in a couple of minutes. And, uh, but uh, before I go to that, because I have not going to have enough time to either give you details about the continuous fraction algorithm or the Chakravala method, but I will comment on that. So it has uh, been longly claimed that both were essentially the same, okay? And uh, I, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, mathematician uh, Krishnasamy Iyengar studied that in many papers to, uh, to, to compare both. And he concluded that Chakravala could be converted into continued fractions. But still, uh, one has to say that Though it can be interpreted in terms of continued fractions, the Chakravala algorithm is far better, far, far better. In fact, if you gave uh, some simple e example with Euler and continued fraction, you would take 22 steps. And with the Chakravala, you would take seven steps, which can make a huge difference if you have big, large number to, to deal with. And uh, basically, you can think of Chakravala as an highly optimized version of the continued fractions, which goes to the best approximants at each step and skips the other ones. So, and uh, accelerated fra continued fraction algorithm. Okay, but now let us try to understand some mathematics out of all this. So, uh, what I do is to look at k is equal to q of root d and o k be the ring of integer. So, you take uh, alpha plus beta root d, the element of k and you can take it to its norm. So this is say x, norm of x to be alpha plus the product of the conjugates, 
alpha minus beta. Okay. So, this is nothing but alpha square minus d beta square and you recognize the equation. Okay. So, this is a norm. So, in fact, uh, you have and you can uh, go take it to uh, OK, restrict it to OK. If you restrict it to OK, say OK star to Z star, norm of X, this is a group morphism. Uh, this is a monoid morphism, the multiplicative map. That is the norm of x y is equal to norm of x times norm of y. Okay. And uh, basically, what you recognize in the Brahmagupta identity 15 centuries earlier was that this multiplicative property of the norm. This is the one that he found without knowing what a group was and without knowing what a, a field was. Okay. So, this was the identity. And now, you see that solving the equation with uh, 1 there is amounts to find the elements of norm 1. So, you want to find element of norm 1. Okay, or plus or minus one thing, invertible one thing. Okay, so you what you want to understand is what is the set of OK which gives rise to elements of norm one. Okay, so this has been uh, studied quite. Uh, uh, repeatedly, you know, you know that it's going to have a group structure because of this multiplicative structure of the map. Any two you, uh, elements of norm plus or minus one, which we call units, any two units, when you multiply them, give you give rise to another unit. And in fact, this is precisely what uh, Bhaskara has proven quite rigorously that there are infinitely many solutions to the Pell equation. Okay using this identity. Giving, given two solutions, you get a third one. Okay. So, you have a theorem of Dirichlet So, Dirichlet so, so now we skip another century. We are in Europe and in, in the 19th century. So, he lived up to 1859. So, we give a name for this u k is a set of elements of alpha of o k such that the norm of alpha in absolute value is equal to 1. So, what is u k? In our case, this is a finite group plus or minus 1 times a free group of rank 1 because it is a real quadratic field. So, it gives you the fact that if you are uh, if up to this finite ambiguity, which is nothing much in this case, the precisely the set of solutions of the Pell equation with second uh, term equals to 1 is a group of rank 1 generated by one element. So, knowing that element gives you all the solutions. So, the, all the challenge is to find a fundamental solution. So, you all the solutions generated by the fundamental unit epsilon. Okay. So now we go to uh, our equations.
So we go for d equals 2. 